Hello, everybody, and welcome to Adobe Live. My name is Flynn, and I'm here with my friend and your friend, Ian Haig. How are you, sir? Good morning. I'm very well. Thank you, Flynn. How are you? I'm very good, thank you. Um, and hello to everybody in chat. Um, we've got Festus in chat and Mary. Um, hey, Steve, watching from the UK at 11.30 p.m. Uh, very good. All right. Great to Great to have you. Great to have you here. Um, so we're um, we're here doing Premiere Pro stuff. We're putting the fun in Premiere Pro, making you a pro from the fun in <laughs> Premiere Pro. Um, and we're we're quite, we're in part two of a of a four part series of learning Premiere Pro. Um, and uh, and yeah, and the last one was last week. Obviously, we've got another two to go. Um, we've got a great lesson plan kind of set out, which Ian will take us through in a, in a second. Um, but we're also very open to suggestions and questions as we're going through because we are live. So rather than just watching something on replay, you can actually ask us questions about what's going on. Um, we'll do our best to answer it. Um, and by we, I mean Ian, because <laughs> he is the pro. <laughs> um, and uh, and I'll, as I'll, I'll just stand here and, and ask silly questions to Ian. But, um, but Ian, for those who may have missed the first episode, maybe you could give us a bit of a recap of who you are and what you do, and then also kind of segue us into what we're, what we're going to be doing today. Right. Well, thank you for that uh, introduction. It's, um, <laughs> yes, we, I'm... Uh, basically, I have a little company here in Sydney, and I've been working with video for many, many years now. Um, I've lived in uh, London and Amsterdam. That's probably where I first got the, the, the video bug. And so I film, I edit, I do animation, I write little uh, scripts and so on as well uh, to, to speed up workflow and, and uh, make things easier. So I'm just an all round bit of a computer nerd. And what I love about uh, doing video on the computer is just this wonderful amalgamation, this blend of the aesthetic and the technical. So you get the, the best of both worlds. You get to geek out with your favorite tools, but you also get to create something like beautiful storytelling and you know, making an emotional connection with people. And so I think it's a, the perfect blend of those. Yeah, fantastic. And we had a lot of fun last week and there was a lot of there was a lot of kind of questions that came up in the chat. Um, and by chat, I mean over at behance.net slash live. So if you're watching on YouTube or somewhere else, come over there, join chat. That's the one that we're, that we're looking at today. Um, and so you can ask questions that kind of helps dictate um, which direction we were going. And quite a lot of uh, what you've put together for us today was based on feedback and questions that the audience really wanted to find out about. Yeah. Yeah, it's um, it's absolutely totally encourage people to jump in with questions at any time. Um, I'm I'm quite happy to to stop what I'm talking about to to go down some other sort of rabbit hole. So today's I've got a I've got a course outline which you can if you go to my website uh, ianhaig.com, then um, follow the link through to Adobe Live and it's session number two. There's a, a there's a basically a sort of an outline. It's going to be a rough outline. There's a lot there, and I don't think we'll get a chance to cover it all today. Um, but if you want to have a look at the kind of things that we'll be going over, that's where you can see the outline. Um, and there's also last week's outline was on there too, and uh, an embed of the YouTube video as well, if, if you are keen to check out some of the uh, bits and pieces from the first session. Yeah, fantastic. Um, that's awesome. Well, so I'm just going to switch over to your, um, your screen now and just kind of explain just for anyone, there's a couple of new faces in chat. Um, just how we kind of uh, how we usually structure everything. So we usually kind of have a part one and then a part two of today. So we are here for two hours, um, and you'll notice that there's a Q and A down the bottom left of the screen. Usually we set that for about halfway, and then at the halfway point we can answer any questions that we haven't maybe that we didn't quite have time to tackle during during the um, during the thing. So you might want to know what Ian's favorite color is. Uh, where, he, <laughs> where he got his fancy haircut, um, but even even towards things like how do I get started um, working for you know working on ads or how do I you know what kind of work do I need in my portfolio? There might be something that you want to ask Ian that's not necessarily related to the course structure, and that's kind of a time that we set aside to focus on anything like that before we jump in to part two. So that's what's going on there. Thank you for uh, for being here with us, and I'll stop talking and let Ian. Take it away. Oh, thank you. So um, I just wanted to give, if, if anyone is interested in learning a little bit more about what I've done and that might inspire some questions, uh, if you can go to uh, my website is ketchup.net.au and that's basically got a, a kind of a little overview and some of the types of work we've done at self-promotion over. Awesome. Um, 
All right, so this is this is today's kind of very rough sort of outline. And as I as I mentioned, I think we'll be jumping around and um, making it up as I go along a little bit. But um, I thought we'd kick off today with one of my favorite um, Premiere plugins or, or effects rather. It's called Warp Stabilizer, and it has got me out of um, some pretty sort of sticky situations <laughs> before. It's it's a bit of a silver bullet. It's 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 effectively. If you've ever shot footage, um, and I think the vast majority of us have shot footage and had a look at it, and it's been a bit shaky, and you know, you you kind of think, how can I improve that? Warp stabilizer will uh, come to your rescue. So this is I'm, I'm basically going to use the same footage that I used last week. This is um, bits and pieces that I shot on our holiday in uh, Japan a few years ago, and. So this clip I, I took just with a shallow depth of field and uh, with the uh, intention of making a title so that this would be a backdrop and we could put some type on top of it. And it was shot on my 5D Mark II, um, which I love that camera. It's an absolute workhorse. But as you can see, when I play it back, you can see that it is actually bouncing around a little bit because that's just handheld and there was no um, stabilization and I didn't have a gimbal. It wasn't on a tripod or anything. So that might be the look that you're going for, but if you wanted to smooth that out a bit, then there's a there's an effect built into Premiere Warp Stabilizer. So what I'm going to do is just in the, my window here, the um, we're going to go to the window at the top here, Workspaces, and I'll go to Effects, which is one of your built-in workspaces, which will just lay out the Premiere interface to concentrate on effects. We covered the workspaces a little bit last week. And so now let's just rearrange the panels so that I can see all of my effects up here. So the easiest way to, to get to warp stabilizer, if you know what you're looking, obviously you can flip open these and browse the effects if that's your thing. But if you know what you're after, and in this instance, we know it's warp stabilizer, it just sounds cool. It sounds like some sort of, I don't know, Star Trek. It's Star Trek you know, for warp sure. Engage warp stabilizer. Exactly what so I was going to say. So you can see it. <laughs> yeah, you can see it down here. Warp stabilizer. So I can just drag that from here and just pop it straight onto the clip that I'm interested in, and it immediately gives you this analyzing and background. That means that you can keep editing. You can keep like ticking away because it can take a little while for it to. Basically, it'll it'll look at your image. It identifies points that it recognizes throughout the duration of the clip. And then it figures out how do I distort or move this clip to make those points to, to minimize the movement in them. Mm. So it's done its thing. And now if I play back that clip, you can see it's very, very comparatively still. Just by way of comparison, if I put them side by side, so I'm just going to copy that one and I'll paste it here. So this, they've both got warp stabilizer on them now. If I double click the first clip, and I will go into the, the um, this is the properties for that clip down there. You can see there's warp stabilizer. I'm just gonna hit delete. So now we have one copy of the clip without warp stabilizer and one with. And if I play them back side by side, so we'll get five seconds of the original clip and you can see that bouncing around mm. and then it'll switch over to the smooth effects one with the warp stabilizer applied. And you can see what an enormous difference that makes. So if I go into warp stabilizer effects here, there's a bunch of different settings in there so that I can actually make it completely still. I can change the amount of smoothness so that if I only wanted it to be, if I didn't want to take out all of the handheld mm -hmm. effect, I can move that down. Uh, Just in case anyone blinked, um, yep. how did you get to the settings there for warp stabilizer? over on the left. Is it when you click, when you're already in there, they pop up or is there a way to navigate to there just in case? Because I think I right, find so that sometimes you, Premiere can be a little bit hard to navigate for people coming from some of the some of the other apps. Yeah, definitely. Uh, thank you for pulling me up. Uh, so it's, if I had, um, when I double clicked it, I just basically got the clip in that window there. Mm -hmm. And if I went to a window and then effect controls, that's where I will see all of the properties based that are 
associated with that clip. Right. So in there, that's where you've got the position of the clip, where it sits on the stage, the scale of the clip. Um, and down here, you've got all of the different effects. Mm. You can flip them open or if you need to see what's in there. And if you had multiple effects in there, so for example, if I put on another, I'm going to put on a Lumetri color and that is right here. So if I, I can either drop that on the clip in the timeline. So I've just, I've chosen my effect from over here on the right. I can drop that straight on the clip in the timeline, or I can drop it straight into the uh, effect controls window and mm. you'll see it just appear in there. Uh, if I make some, basically, I'll, let me change the temperature of this clip so I'll make it a lot warmer. Mm -hmm. So you can see here the the effects are stacking up so that I've got warp stabilizer, I've got lumetri color one after the other. So they're both applied to this clip down here. Uh, another thing that's worth noting is that when Eclipse, when um, might be a little bit difficult to see, but this clip on the left here doesn't have any effects applied. So under the effects uh, icon here, it's just gray, mm. whereas this does have effects applied. And so the effects is lit up. It's um, in color. So if you're, when you're working, if you need to see which, at a glance, which of your clips have got effects applied to them. There's a little visual indicator that lets you see at a glance which ones do and which ones don't. Cool. Um, and while I'm on that, so you can also very quickly toggle effects on and off. Um, I'm just back up here in the effect controls window and there's a little FX. That's a button. If I click that, then I can very quickly that's not deleted the effect. That's just basically toggling it on and off. So if I want to see what it looked like before and after, then I can do so very easily. You can change the order of the effects by dragging them up and down. And the order of the effects can make a difference depending on what effects you've applied. And over here on the right, this resets the effect right back to the beginning. So if I click that, it's gotten rid of all of my changes without getting rid of the effect. And similarly, if I decide that I really love this effect over here and I want to apply it to, let me get a brand new clip in there so that you can see what I'm talking about. So I will just chuck a different clip onto the timeline. Now, if I decided that I really love this warm effect here and I wanted to put that onto this clip here, I'm just going to select that clip in the timeline. I'm going to right click and I'm going to choose copy. And now come over to this clip. I'm going to right click that clip and I'm going to choose paste attributes. So now I get to choose which of the attributes from the second clip I want to apply to the first clip. So in this instance, um, motion is like where the clip is on the stage. It's the scale. And I'm going to be touching on that a little later on as well. So I'm, in this instance, they both have the same scale and they're both in the same position. So I'll just leave that. It's not going to affect anything. And down here, I want to paste the Lumetri color effect, but not the warp stabilizer. So I'll turn off warp stabilizer. I'm going to hit OK. And now this clip has got exactly the same settings as this clip. So I've just literally copied and pasted just the attributes, just the properties from the second clip that I was interested in. And I've just pasted them straight onto the first clip. So that's a huge time saver. And you mm. can do that with multiple clips as well. That's an awesome, that's an awesome time saver. Yeah, it's, um, it's extremely handy. <laughs> so Next thing that I wanted to touch on. So this was, a, that's the warp stabilizer. And similarly, now I've decided that I want to get rid of the, um, I, I've decided I don't like that Lumetri color. I liked it better before when it was the more natural color. So there's a couple of ways I can get rid of that effect. So one is to, if I select that clip, and again, if this window wasn't showing up here, I can just go to window and choose effect controls. That's going to bring up my controls over here. I'm just going to select Lumetri color and I'm just going to press delete. 
and now that effect is gone. Or nice. the other way to do it is I can, similar to how we did it before, right click on that clip in there. I'm gonna choose remove attributes. And now I can just decide which of the attributes I want to get rid of. So in this instance, I'll say, all right, I want to keep my warp stabilizer effect. I want to delete. I'm just gonna delete Lumetri color and hit okay. So if I had multiple clips that I wanted to get rid of, like reset, then this is a really, you can like drag select over a bunch of them, choose remove attributes and just get really fine tuned and affect them all at once. So that's a massive time saver as well. Nice. And it's all about so, time, like time, it's like saving, saving time really. Cause like the more efficient you can be in this sort of thing, the more time you have to be creative. Um, obviously time is money um you yep. know when working on commercial sense but also when you're learning as well like it's always much more fun to be using shortcuts and ha find those time saving things it just allows you to spend more time within the program um to use it as a tool to you know access your creativity absolutely and it's if you're doing something that's really repetitive and monotonous i mean you can come to sort of you know get bored or you know you're thinking that there's got to be a better way and there's so often there is, and it just requires a little bit of digging, a little bit of searching, mm -hmm. and to find out that they've, they've, someone has already been there, someone's already kind of got there and, and found this task monotonous ahead of you right. and figured out a better way to do it. And I just, that is for me one of the, the great things about um, these sorts of environments that the, the, they've really kind of thought about how can we take the monotony out of this? How can we make it? more enjoyable and focus on, as you say, the creative side of things rather than just getting bogged down in the repetitive tasks that actually humans do very poorly and computers do really well. Yeah, exactly. I like it. Cool. So um, the next thing that I would like to touch on is around the uh, question of titles. So this is originally, as I mentioned before, I shot this with the idea of putting a title on top. And so we can get some text on there very easily. So down here, we've got the uh, our tools. Depending on the layout of your screen, they might be in a different place, but we can jump to the type tool really quickly just by pressing the T key. So no, no modifiers or anything like that, just T. I've set up my keyboard uh, to be a little bit different. Let's just go back to Premiere Defaults. Uh, if I press the T key, then I just get the type. And this works much like how you'd expect in a different program like Illustrator or InDesign. If I just click on there, I can start typing. I'm going to call this ice cream in Kyoto. And there's some text. So as you can see, it's put that on uh, its own track in my timeline. So that's a, uh, I can treat that like any other clip. I can have that coming in later. I can put, uh, I can trim it if I want to so that that comes in and it disappears again and i can put transitions on there as well so if i just select one edge of that and i can say apply default transitions and now that will fade in mm -hmm. so it's just basically a clip like anything else but you're thinking well that does not look good ian and you'd be <laughs> right so we can we can change that so you can it's the essential graphics panel is the way that you can override the properties of your text and, and tweak them to your heart's content. So I'm just going to open up that essential graphics panel, give myself a little bit more room here. Now in the essential graphics panel, it's um, what's worth noting is that you can have multiple elements in there. So you can have, this is, we're looking at one element, one text element. If I've got that selected and I choose my type tool again, click again and type um, uh, on a sunny day. Now you can see that I've got two elements in there. It was a really good question just got... then. You're probably doing yeah. it instinctively, um, but uh, how did you stop typing? Because you very quickly, you were typing, then you press Y in sunny day. And then, was it escape or was it something else? It's a question. great question. Oh, sorry. Yes, that's... That's escape, yeah. Yep. So I just tap the escape key and that um, that takes me out of uh, type mode and puts me back into sort of, um, you know, stage mode and, and moving things around mode. Great. So yeah, that's, you just tap the escape key. That's, 
it's not the same in every program, but um, I think in yeah, like Illustrator uh, and perhaps Photoshop as well. It's Escape will take you out of text editing mode. Mm, yeah, perfect. Great question. Yep. Yeah, very good question. Um, so now, as you can see, I've got two type elements in there, and there's only one clip on the timeline, and so that's acting like one unit so that when I trim that clip then both of my um, both of these type elements will come in and out at the same time I can edit them individually up here just by clicking on the relevant type element that I'm interested in right now I'm just going to concentrate on one but it's just worth knowing that there's this is a, a slightly different way of doing things rather than having a separate track element for every type yeah um, box mm. and that, that's it's kind of a it's an elegant way that that they put it together because that means that you can have uh if you had a whole bunch of different graphic elements so you could have rectangles you could have an animation on them and so on and they'll act as one clip you don't have to select every single one individually you can mm. just move that one clip around and put it wherever you like or copy and paste it and duplicate it so but if you're wondering why it seems like there are two clips there and there's only one in the timeline then that's you go into a central graphics panel and then you can edit them individually you can turn them on and off as well with a little eyeball and they can be different different fonts different weights all sorts of different you can still edit exactly. them completely as type yeah yeah so if i if i click on that one ice cream tokyo i just select the text box and now i can come in here and i can choose let's see here we'll choose uh there we go, something like that maybe. And then I can you know, use all, all of my usual kind of um, type settings in there to, to get them, get it looking just how I like. Uh, I can click directly on them as well and just hit delete if I don't like anything anymore. And you can see there's these handy little guides pop up as well that help me lay it out on the, on the screen. So that if I, you know, if I want to get that centered, I can just drag that and the red guide will pop up in the middle when it's right in the center. Alternatively, I've got the align and transform controls over here. Mm -hmm. So that's going to center my text box vertically and this one will center it horizontally. So even though that type is actually left aligned, it'll still figure out the bounding box of the type and it will center it on the stage. Cool. with those two and you can you know you can align multiple elements it's got everything in there that you that you might want so now that's um that's basically the the real basics so you can create your own type you can put um we won't get too much into the uh the advanced features of this right now i just wanted to touch on it quickly but we um one thing that you can do is create your type in After Effects. And this is a video that we touched on um, in the video that we touched on like a, a month or so ago, creating a, uh, I don't know how exactly how to pronounce it, Mogurt, which is like motion graphics okay. template. Mm -hmm. You can create a Mogurt file in After Effects and then have bring it into Premiere and then the type is editable. And Adobe have kindly provided, I'm just going to delete that, a whole bunch of Mogurt files for your use. So again, in the Essential Graphics panel, uh, as you can see, Essential Graphics, we were just looking at the Edit pane, but in the Browse pane, there's a whole bunch of pre-built, um, pre-built sort of graphics templates that you can just drag straight into your mm. production. So you've got like movie credits in there. You've got animated. Movie credits uh, makes everything look very official, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah, it's it really Hague does. By Ian Hay, produced by Ian Hay. Yeah, they yeah, clear how epic. I mean, this is like there's some real kind of. With this, is, this looks like Star Wars to me. I mean, let's just drag that. So I'm just dragging it straight out of the library. It's all ready to go. And when I play that back, uh, it's not connection to Adobe fonts for some reason. But that's okay. When I play that back, you'll see. I mean. Look at that epic now yeah, that's star trek yeah um there was a great question JJ. before yeah, as well um steve was asking can the different text boxes so going back to the one we had before 
Um, can the yep. diff- I thought we lost everything then. Everything went black for a second. <laughs> I was like, not again. We had, yeah, YouTube was crazy yesterday, uh, last week. Um, can the different text boxes be faded in and out separately, even though they're on the same track? Uh, they can, um, but I think that you would probably need to, uh, well, actually, let's have a look here. So if I was to um, make my own text box in here, so we'll call this uh, title one for want of a better name. And then we will put on here subtitle. So here are, t- here are two text boxes. I'm just going to um, center those. So here we are one track and there are the two subtitles in there. Now, if you come over to the effect controls, you can see that these have got all of the all of the parameters that I'm interested in um, over here. I can flip open uh, the properties for Title One, and it's automatically named it with the text in here, so it's easy to tell them apart. So if I wanted to uh, bring Title One in, I can flip that open and come down to Transform, and here's the opacity. So I can set a keyframe on that. I can bring the opacity right down to zero, mm. set a keyframe. I'm going to move forward. I'm just going to hold down shift. I'm going to type the, the right arrow a couple of three times, which will bring it 15 frames into the future. And I'm going to bring the opacity back up to hundred percent. So now you can see that here is it's a bit difficult to see because it's cut, cutting off half of the keyframe, but that's keyframe one, the opacity is at zero and keyframe two, the opacity is mm. at hundred. So that's fading in and if I come back up now to subtitle, I can do the same thing, but I'm going to start here where maybe I'll start at like about halfway, maybe here. So I'll put a, I'll set the opacity to zero. As you can see, it's faded out to zero now. Set a keyframe and I'm going to choose one, two, three into the future and come back up to a hundred percent. So now, even though it's one track here, when I press play, they fade in separately. Cool. So there you go. You can you can do it. Yeah, and so they'll, they'll still behave. That still behaves as one unit. You can move mm-hmm. that around, and yeah. So you can do it in Premiere, and um, that's one of the one of the uh, questions from last week was around like, what can you achieve in Premiere? without you know having to go into after effects and there mm-hmm. is actually a lot that you can do in premiere it's um it's kind of amazing how much you can achieve in premiere without having to jump into after effects and that's just uh one example you, there's so much now you can do with type um and animation without having to jump into after effects so if after mm-hmm. effects isn't your bag you can actually achieve so much in premiere without having to fire up ae there, there you go. Um, there was another yep. question um, from Anthony. Thanks for covering. Thanks for covering that. Um, it was great. Mm-hmm. Um, can you convert text from image to vector within Premiere Pro? It's an interesting question. That's a that's a really interesting question. Um, I've not had cause to do that, so I've never looked into it. Um, I'm not aware of being able to do that. Uh, so I would probably have to take that question on notice and uh, figure it out. But yeah. I. Yeah, to the best of my knowledge, I don't. I have not. I have not noticed that. So I will. I'm going to say a tentative. I don't think so. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> not something that normally will come up. So that's great. Um, yeah, cool. That's really good. I'm um, just um, back onto the title thing. I think it's really interesting. Like, because um, just just to understand, like particularly with Premiere Pro, and the same is with true with After Effects. Is there? I mean, really, all all the programs. Like, there are multiple ways to do things as well. So. Um, like in that case, you had uh, you know two things nested. That might be something if you know that the fade in the fade out is going to be exactly the same at multiple points in your project. Maybe you want to nest it in if you know you're going to be moving around a lot. Um, but then of course there's the other way to do it, which would be just having two separate, um, you know, two a, a title up the top and then a subtitle down the bottom as well is like another way to do it, yeah. which might be faster to do if you're just doing a little project. So I think it kind of illustrates really early on in our stream like there are multiple ways to. To do things and it's great to know the different ways because sometimes you might want the really fast solution other times you might be setting up a bigger project and you know that it's going to pay dividends in the future because you've nested everything together and you can move it around a lot 
yeah that's that's so true it's i think it, you can be um obviously if you're doing a one-off like for uh you, you're making a video about uh, that you're never going to use the styles from again like it's you know um your daughter's fifth birthday party and you know if you're going to spend like six hours making templates for all of the titles and that then maybe i don't know that's fun but um it might not be the best use of time but if you um for, for if you're doing like a corporate job for example and so your client wanted a, a, a library where you had uh, a whole bunch of pre-built titles that were had to be consistent every single time so the colors the fonts the layout the design but also the animation and the timing of the animation mm. then definitely worth investing the time to create those motion graphic templates probably in after effects and then making those into mogur um, files that you can then just edit very easily i mean you could be using them or you might be handing them over to somebody else but mm. there's just you can't put a price on that level of consistency and the time saving is absolutely huge and they've just made it so easy to use um uh, and i think one of the one of the really clever things about it is that you can expose just the things that you want to change and so if you were handing over your motion graphics templates to somebody else you can you can set it up so that they can change the type but not the size of the type or not the font of the type mm. so that you're going to get that consistency you can hand it off and know that they're not going to suddenly decide that your corporate font is like comic sans comic sans or papyrus that's right <laughs> yeah awesome great yeah good stuff so coming back to that um that title this epic title which is i mean yeah i don't think there's any other word than epic um <laughs> if i can just basically that's that's fully editable so that when i come in here you can see here's a whole bunch of the um you can actually see how they've put it together so the the fonts uh sorry the effects that they've used on there um and the text and all of the keyframes are in there and to edit that all i have to do is just basically oh serious error has occurred <laughs> we're going out live folks <laughs> that is always the the murphy's law of when you when you go live nothing works as intended normally yeah <laughs> gives us a another opportunity to look at the startup screen which is really good <laughs> Um, so this is how you oh, open Premiere go. Pro in case it crashes. Yep. Okay. And do you want to open the previous project? Yes. Thank you very much. Thank you for auto saving. Is it every five yep. every five minutes that auto saves? It's uh, it's you can set that up to, and that's a, it's a good little segue. Um, so if you go, if I'm going to go into the preferences here, so I'll just go up to preferences, and we ignore that. Preferences, autosave. So we just went to Premier menu, preferences, autosave, slightly different on Windows, but more or less the same. And you can choose up here. So you mm. can say automatically save projects. So I've got it set to 15 minutes and maximum project versions of 20, which is pretty handy. And I, I tend to, I've sort of developed a kind of a, a nervous like uh, autosave function myself where mm -hmm. I just hit Command S every few minutes anyway. Um, but also I, I like to sort of version my own files as well, because that way I can always roll back. And so it'll be just like, oh, one, oh, two, oh, three, oh, four, and just so on and so on. And when I'm working on a job with a client, I might get up to version, you know, 60 of mm -hmm. a, a project. And it's like, it's just really, really um, reassuring to know that I can roll back and pull something out of an old project and bring it into a new project and, uh, mm -hmm. and keep going. So. It's, everyone's got their own way of working, but for me, just making manual versions and, and keeping them safe and tidy is a very reassuring way to work. Yeah, the the auto, the, the um, muscle reflex of um, saving, I didn't realize I was doing it, but I was doing a live stream um, using Audition recently, which was like a four hour live stream, just an editing one. Mm. And um, every time I save, the screen like flashes black and I didn't realize it was coming through on the stream until some people were telling me and I couldn't work out what it was. It was actually every time I saved, every time I saved and I was doing right. it probably every minute. And so they're like, something wrong with the stream, right. but it was just me automatically saving. I had no idea I was saving that often. That's who would have guessed that saving it would cause the screen to flash black. That's yeah. really 
a weird thing has happened with streaming. You never, you never know what's going to happen with the streams. Yeah. Yep. Mm -hmm. That's a good tagline. Um, <laughs> yeah, exactly. So coming, coming back here. So we've got, um, uh, every now and then, uh, there we go. It's a bit better. So if I come back to, it was basically what we were going to do and hopefully that won't, um, won't happen this time, but I'm just going to choose my text tool. And if I come in here and I can literally just type in whatever. So let's we'll call this ice cream in Kyoto. And then all of those effects will be live. And that's, that's just a really, really nice feature about, you know, these built in, um, library titles is that they're designed in a way that you can just edit them with a minimum of effort. If I, if I come back to, I'm going to choose my, um, up here, choose my effects workspace again, go to essential graphics. You can see that here's a different title. I'm going to drop that into place. That's automatically loaded it up. And so this title has got a, a box around the main title. And if I get my text tool, select all, and I'm just going to type ice cream in Kyoto, you'll see that the box actually scales with the type so that it will automatically change depending on what you've put in there. So it's, it's very easy to use. You don't have to have any knowledge of After Effects. You don't have to have any knowledge of animation. You just drag it right out and it'll, it'll appear. Okay. Okay, so that was basically we've got we've had a look at the warp stabilizer, we've had a look at the text tool, and we've had a look at library titles. Uh, last week, someone was asking about adding narration to a, mm -hmm. which is which I really, I love the idea of this. I have never added narration, but now I'm thinking I should go back to some videos that I've done and, and do like a director's cut where I just uh, remember DVDs <laughs> where they actually had directors. Commentary, commentary over the top. Yeah. Oh my God. Um, I had an old DVD player that I lost the remote to or it broke or something. And as it was breaking, it automatically turned that on. <laughs> and so every time there was a film, there was just someone, some like tired old director talking in the background of everything, every DVD that got put into that thing until I had to throw it out. It literally sounds like an idea for a Black Mirror episode <laughs> where someone just is walking around. Um, actually, the Will Ferrell movie like that where he was getting um the, someone was narrating his life <laughs> narration so this this is um i i had did a little bit of research and it was actually it's very very um simple to set up so here um now i'm just going to press play and hopefully just let me know if that's going to how that volume is for you all right i don't know if that's coming through for you but there's a little bit of ambient sound on these uh, Tokyo. Might need to uh, turn it up a little bit. Let's try turning it up uh, a little right bit. Here. Uh, oh, that looks like it's pretty far up. Yeah, it's pretty far up. Oh, it's not super important if you can't hear it, but it's, and the principle is the same in any case. And so effectively, what you've got here down here is um, from last week, these are your video tracks. And so these are always going to be vision. There's mm -hmm. going to be visual. And just below them, you've got your audio tracks. So V1, V2, V3, video, and A1, A2, A3 are audio tracks. And so you can see here, I'm going to zoom in a little bit. Um, I'm just going to use the back tick key to expand this window. So if I just hover over it and press back tick, no other modifier keys, then it expands to show the whole timeline. And then by pressing shift equal sign, I can expand the the, so basically shift minus makes the uh, tracks vertically collapsed. And if I press shift plus or shift equals, then it expands them. And so it makes it a little bit easier to see. So as you can see here, we've got the, this is a video, video um, of some beautiful cherry blossoms. And down here is the audio, the, the waveform for that audio underneath. And so we want to narrate this track. And I, by right clicking, I'm going to go to track two audio because that's empty at the moment. By right clicking, I can choose voiceover record settings right here. And it's really just a matter of, as you can see, it's um, 
it's picking up my voice right now through the MacBook microphone. You, if you were going to use a different input, then you could just choose it here. And it's going to give me a pre-roll of three seconds, which basically just gives you a countdown so that you can get ready to go. And then you get counted in and you start your narration. So I'll just go back to where we were before. And I'm just going to give you 15 seconds of narration. Please for, I apologize in advance. I press the uh, this is the little microphone there. I'm just going to press that and three, two, Here we go. one. Kyoto, some of the most beautiful vegetation I've ever seen. Little owls, cute little owl things and fans, all the fans you could possibly want, plus candles. And here's my kid eating ice cream or wearing ice cream and a roof that I like the look of. Thanks for joining me. Now, when I press <laughs> that button again, that was really good. Uh, thank you. <laughs> thank you. That was really Thanks nice. very much. I liked it. Yeah. Very, ple very pleasant. I mean, maybe not Werner Herzog, but you know, I'm a beginner. It had like a Rick and um, Morty, like improvisational tone. Here's some candles. <laughs> <laughs> I'll it. take it. Um, and what that's done is it's created a brand new audio right here. You've got the, the so the, this was our original. And this is my um, laughably amateur soundtrack. Uh, now I can I can see at a glance that the levels for these clips, the audio levels, are much higher than the audio levels for my narration. Mm. So I'm just going to switch over to the audio workspace by clicking on it up here, and that's automatically dropped me back into um, have some handy audio tools. The one that I'm interested in at the moment is the audio track mixer. Now I won't go into this like in too much detail right now because it's uh, it's a pretty audio is a as you know Flynn a completely different world and there is a lot to audio so mm -hmm. we'll just touch on some of the basics right now. But by each track I can control the overall volume. So rather than having to adjust each individual clip right now I can adjust the overall volume so for all of those clips which are on track A1 don't send don't ask me again um, and I can adjust the overall audio volume for for this one I can I could go in here and do it uh, manually which um, uh, I know the keyboard shortcut but I don't know the where it is in the menus wait one moment Okay, you know what? I don't know where that is in the menu, so I'll just do it the way that I was originally going to. If I press play now, I can't I can't hear that at all. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to select that and I'm just going to type G for gain. And that just brings up the audio gain I can adjust for that one clip. Nice. I can see that the peak amplitude is minus nearly minus 20. That's as loud as it gets. And given that the maximum volume that you can possibly have is uh, zero decibels, we can tell that this is actually pretty quiet. So I'm just going to say I want to maximize, normalize all the peaks. I won't make it at zero because I want to blow anyone's heads off. We'll go minus mm -hmm. six, for example. And what I want you to keep an eye on is just down here. You can see how these peaks in my audio file are very low. If I press OK to that, you can see now they're way, way, way higher. Mm. So that's just brought up the volume of my voice, of my narration. If you can, I don't know, calling it narration might be overstating it. Um, <laughs> and if I press, you can see as well, we touched before on um, when a clip has got effects applied to it, then the effects icon changes color. So if I go undo, you can see the effects is at zero. It's um, nothing's happened to it. It's gray. If I press redo, now it's yellow. So you can see that something's been done to that clip. So again, really handy way to see at a glance what has been affected or what you've um, mm. edited on your timeline. If I press play now, still can't hear myself. So I'm going to choose the audio track mixer here. And A1 is the uh, my background noise and A2 is the narration track. If I make this window a bit bigger, I can see audio one here, I'm going to drop down the volume of that track. 
So I'm going to drop it down a lot and I'm going to boost the volume of audio too, which is where my narration is. And we'll see how that goes. <laughs> now, I don't know if that's coming through for you. It is coming through. Yep. Can hear okay. it much, much more clearly. Okay, great. So I could probably drop that down even more and boost that up even more and maybe drop the overall volume down a little smidge, but Kyoto, some of the most beautiful vegetation I've ever seen. Little owls, cute little owl things and fans. Oh. So God, I can really hear my accent. <laughs> but um <laughs> That's the, the problem the, with doing go. narration or anything like that is is listening to your own voice back, which is extremely yeah. e extremely difficult. But you have a lovely oh, buttery I... voice, so that's fine. <laughs> You're too kind. <laughs> well, that's that's effectively that's in a nutshell um, how straightforward it is to to get started with narration. And so it's it's basically just setting up a clip, setting up an empty track, um, getting your input settings correct so that you're getting the right input device. And then clicking this friendly little uh, microphone button, it'll give you a countdown, and then just get cracking and uh, narrate away. So it's uh, it's actually a lot of fun, as I've found out. Um, <laughs> one one more thing that is probably important to mention is you can see over here in the uh, project panel, it's made this audio to uh, file. So that's it's automatically named and saved the narration for me. If I uh, want to give that a name or keep it with the project, it's important to know where that is on disk so that you can, uh, I would actually probably copy it to a new location and then relink to it, which I might just show you how to do really quickly. Mm. So if I, if I right click on that file um, and I can come down here, it'll be reveal, uh, show, uh, why is that not? Reveal and find that. That's what I want. Yeah. Yeah. So I choose that. Uh, it'll obviously on uh, Microsoft Windows, it'll be slightly different. Um, but in principle, it's the same idea. It'll show you in the Windows Explorer where your file is. Now, if I want to give that right now, um, I could just leave that with the name Audio 2. That I don't recommend because if you have more than one file on your disk called audio 2 and then you relink to the wrong version of it then you might you know it becomes very difficult to disentangle the files and so the way that i work is like i want to have every single one of my media files has got to have an original name they've got to have mm. a um a name that is not duplicated anywhere else so i've got a little keyboard shortcut set up for this which basically just types today's date for me you can also type it in manually. And then I would probably, you know, if I was working on a, um, a job, uh, yeah, it would have a job number. Again, give it a unique identifier. For today's purposes, we'll just call that, I'll call that in narration, watch out, David Attenborough. And I'm just going to copy that and I'm going to um, come to my uh, sound file, which I've already set up. Or oh, put that into voiceover folder. We'll put that into professional. Professional, yeah, that's and where it lives. <laughs> that's right. And I'm going to, I'm going to on the, my Mac. I'm going to hold down uh, Command Option and press V, which is going to cut it from its original location and move it here. So it's no longer in the in the other file where we just were. I can show you that it's gone, and it is in fact in my the job folder for this. And when I come back into Premiere now. Premier is going to say, hey, I don't have this file anymore simply because I renamed it and I moved it. Mm. So that's fair enough. Uh, it doesn't, uh, wouldn't be fair for Premier to know what I'd done with it. I'm just going to press cancel and then right click on that audio file and I'm going to choose replace footage. Now, in this instance, I, I know that it's the same file. It's not going to... Um, it's not going to complain about it being a different format or it's not going to complain about it being a different duration. I'm just going to drag that into that window and hit open and it'll relink to it. Now it's updated the name there and I can file it away neatly in my project, but I would prefer to go through that rigmarole than have it 
somewhere um, outside of the job folder and also with a kind of generic name. This way I can find it again and I, I know that it's with all of my other media. So it's a, a safer way to work if you like. That's awesome. I really like it. And, um, cool. and that obviously helps with like search functionality as well, like kind of later down the track, whether you're searching within Finder or anything like that, like having everything labeled and very neat means future Ian will thank past Ian for that little bit of extra effort. Totally. My wife is like, why are you so neat and tidy on the computer and not in real life? And I'm like, <laughs> well, I don't know. It's a personality thing. I just, on the computer, and I've just, you know, through experience, and you know, everybody um, I'm sure finds that the same is that you develop your own style of working and your own way of um, filing things away. And so mm -hmm. um, for me, this, this system makes a lot of sense. Uh, and I'm sure it's different for everybody else. And I'm sure there are people looking at the way that I'm working and going like, I would not do it like that. Mm -hmm. And that's cool. As long as, as long as I suppose the, the most important thing is consistency. So that if you are naming your files all the same way, then when you're searching for the right file, then you're going to find it. Um, particularly, sometimes you've, you've got to come back to a job or a project that you worked on years ago. And if, you, if you've got all of the files together, you can pull it back and everything links back into place. You don't have, you don't have mm -hmm. files strewn across endless USB sticks and zip drives, um, you know, then <laughs> you can, it's just going to be a much easier way to work. And so I'm a real stickler for making sure things are named correctly and in the right place. Like it really mm. makes my skin crawl when I see files that are named, you know, untitled 12, final, final, final. Oh, version oh, seven. No, real please. client version. <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. Final, really this time. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, it's, uh, that's not for me. Yeah, and it's definitely good good practice to get into. Now we have about three and a half minutes until... Q and A. We could start Q and A early, or we could we could get stuck into something. What would you like to do? Okay. Um, well, the next we've we've basically so we've had a look at uh, adding narration. Um, the next one is effects and masks, which per perhaps we can do Q and A now because effects and masks um, is is like there's quite a lot there mm -hmm. uh, to get through. So why don't we um, get into the Q and A then? Awesome. Great. Well, um, let us know if you do have your questions uh, in chat. So just behance.net slash live. Uh, let us know. We've got a little bit of time to tackle tackle some of those now. Um, you were chatting about kind of saving multiple versions. I mean, it's like 20 different versions there. You're also saying that it wasn't uncommon when you're working with a client to have lots of different versions. So you can always go back. Um, when you're working with big files like this, I imagine that you need a pretty robust storage system for something like that like if if i've just got a mac laptop and i wanted to do that practice i feel like i'm going to run out of this you know space uh pretty quickly so what what's your approach to to storage other than labeling your files correctly yeah so there's i guess there's um my philosophy on this is is like um when i say multiple versions i should probably clarify as well like i'm of the um uh, belief so we're getting into some really philosophical kind of territory now but um, i'm of the belief that you should have one file that is when i go into what my um, project folder there is there is like one premiere file and one after effects file mm. and the versions that i've saved are in a folder buried away called versions and so the the older oh. versions of the file are all tucked away somewhere else so that if i come back to a job i don't have to sift through the files trying to understand which is the latest one so when i make a new version of a file i'll make the new version and i'll put the old version away so that that way there's only ever one master file and it's just saved me so many times because I, it's like when you get a job from somebody else that someone else has been working on and um after effects users will know what i mean when you open up someone else's file and it is like it is like walking into a kind of um, a, a lost Egyptian, you know, pyramid kind of thing where you're just, you're trying to sort of peer through the darkness and you're trying to understand what has happened here. What does it mean? There are like these hieroglyphics on the walls and you've got this kind <laughs> of like dim candle light and you're trying to piece together like what, what, where did this come from and what does it mean? And it's, it's just, 
it, it completely does your head in because there are so many ways to achieve something in a program like Premiere or After Effects. And so I, I, I think it's like for me, really, really important to just have that, that kind of simple structure where if I open something up, I can see these are the these are the files that are, I need to know. These are the ones and everything else is auxiliary to that and it's tucked away. So it's not hidden, but it's just not obvious um, that, you know, it, it's in a, in a way it just reduces ambiguity so that you've kind of mm. made it as easy as possible because a future version of you is just as likely as some complete stranger to be confused over what your intentions were. So oh, yeah. it's like it's like being kind to the future version of you by by signposting things and making it really obvious what you were intending to do. Mm. Um, regarding the storage thing, I think that's that's such a great question and it's such a it's something that, um, that I wanted to talk about. It's um, I think it's you're going to uh, one of the biggest bottlenecks when you're editing video is your disk uh, speed and capacity. Mm -hmm. So it's always, it's crucial. If you can, um, obviously like budget is always going to be a concern. If you've got a um, external disk to be your scratch disk, particularly if it's an SSD, a solid state drive, that is a, a really good way to speed things up. So that's basically going to give you super fast um, throughput. So when Premiere or After Effects or whatever program you're using, Photoshop for that matter, uh, it can once it runs out of RAM, it can it can read and write from the uh, SSD, and that's going to if the scratch disk is on a separate disk to your media and your project files, then that's a really a great way to work. Um, it might be uh, so you, you can't just partition one disk and sort of say that partition is my scratch disk and that partition is for my media because that's still the same disk. It needs to be a completely separate disk so that it can be writing and reading from one disk and writing and reading on your scratch disk at right. the same time. Um, if you've got the, if your uh, budget extends to it, then a RAID is uh, an amazing mm. solution. So, you know, we're, we're talking like it's expensive, but for me, like a RAID is um, an essential piece of kit because you just get such fast throughput. And so when you're reading and writing a lot of video, so, you know, and I can have like a job might be a terabyte in size because of all of the um, media in there. You, you really need something that's going to read and write as quickly as possible because otherwise the throughput is just going to be a huge bottleneck. And like when you're scrubbing through the timeline, if you're waiting for it to read, then it's just incredibly unproductive and frustrating. Um, another great way to get more, to squeeze more speed out of your system um, maybe eagle-eyed viewers will have noticed that I was the file, the footage um, that I was working on uh, today has got the word proxy appended to it because I'm working on um, a laptop which is not my main machine, and I wanted, I didn't want to sort of be waiting forever while uh, you know while editing and applying effects, and so I went through and transcoded all of my footage files from MP4, which was the original um, file format that the 5D Mark II produced and transcoded those into a low res uh, pro res quicktime file right. which is much much faster to work with because it's it's um what's known as like an intermediate format and so a high data rate but much easier for the computer to you don't have to um i won't get into the technical details but mp4 is quite a it puts a lot of load on your processor mm. and on your hard drive so by transcoding it into a low res format and Premiere actually has a, an amazing proxy system as well so that you can work on the low res proxy versions of your media and then when it comes time to output it you just switch it back and it will render the final version of your video using the high res uh, files. Yeah, cool. Yeah, very good. So just to be clear, so you when you're talking about having an SSD separately, like you might have an SSD which is, which is your RAID um, or like on or separately, but then and nothing being on your computer hard disk. So you're actually working from, you know, you're referencing files. So you're working from the external SSD. Is that the best way to work? Um, I, I, yeah. So basically, with, when I'm talking about the SSD, that would be for a scratch disk. Oh, okay. so, so that is for your the internal... SSD is like yeah. um, SSDs are quite expensive, and RAID 
the actual, um, this is I'm really going to sort of uh, betray my nerdy credentials here. RAID literally stands for redundant array of inexpensive disks, which is the beauty of RAID is that mm. the inexpensive part. So a RAID, once you've got the, um, the sort of the RAID housing, the actual disks inside are just normal old fashioned disks that oh. run at 7200 RPM, right. but they're super, super cheap. And the, the way that the RAID uh, achieves much, much higher reading and writing access is that it's reading and writing from four disks, in my case, four disks, or you can get like eight or 12 disks all at the same time. So you're, because it's, it's spread the data across all of them. And so that way, by reading and writing from four disks at the same time, you're quadrupling your throughput. Right. Whereas um, an SSD, you you couldn't like my RAID is like eighteen terabytes or something. I I can't imagine what an eighteen terabyte solid. I don't even think that's possible. But it would it would set you back tens of thousands, of hundreds of thousands of dollars right. or something. So um, this is how I, with an SSD you can get a comparatively cheap one. Um, make that your scratch disk, or it doesn't have to be an SSD, but they are much 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 faster than conventional hard drive. But for media. Um, you know, you could put that on a RAID or a, a different external drive. And I think one of the, one of the things that's interesting about like working with video is that you've effectively got like a big chunk of, um, data, which doesn't change often. And that's your media, that's your video. So if you, you can back that up, you know, to uh, a different drive, you know, leave it running for a couple of hours if you have to, and keep that drive somewhere else, your the source files, like a Premiere project file, it's usually only like one, two, three megabytes big. It's not, they're not very big. And so by creating versions of those, you could have 50 versions of those and it's just going to be like 300 meg. Right. So you don't have to worry about like the making multiple versions of a, uh, After Effects or Premiere file is very, very cheap and easy. And I actually store them often. Um, I've got a script that runs that will basically take copies of all of my uh, source files, Premiere and After Effects files, and puts copies of those into Dropbox so that they're saved in the cloud nice. um, because they are quite lightweight. And because they're changing so often, I can just make new versions like very, very quickly. And so I don't have to think too much about it. Whereas the hundreds of gigabytes for video, I'm not going to try and put those in the cloud, certainly not with this internet connection. So, um, it works it works quite well in that regard mm. you can also adobe have got um creative cloud as well and i don't know if you if you want to switch back to the screen really quickly yeah um when we, we touched before on auto save and we didn't i didn't point this out but you've also got save backup project to creative cloud so i'm doing my own uh, sort of dropbox related solution but you can also use this one as well so it'll automatically save a, a cloud-based solution as well. So if you have some sort of um, catastrophic uh, hard drive failure um, or, you know, heaven forbid, a kind of, you know, robbery or a fire or something like that, mm -hmm. then it is really, really great to have a copy of your project in the cloud so that you've particularly, because that's the thing that keeps changing and changing and changing. So that if you've got um, all of your video that doesn't change very often and you could have that a drive, and you know, leave that at your grandma's house or something. But for the, for these versions of the files that change really frequently, make sure that one version is going into the cloud so that you can always pull it back. Particularly if it's like a super important project, like a mission critical project. Mm. Oh, that's cool. That's that's great advice. Yeah, I, I usually save my um, audition files all to the cloud because I'm switching from computers all the time uh, and share, yeah. and sharing it with. Um, with my other host and we kind of share the editing a little bit. So we, we use that a lot. Um, cool. Well, uh, there was one other question that kind of came up before we kind of get into part two. Um, but this question came up a little bit last week and again today, but what would you learn first after effects or premiere if you knew neither? And I realize this is a premiere pro thing. So you don't have to, you don't have to feel like, you know, you're, you're in, you're in team in <laughs> premiere today. Cause I know you use both extensively. So. Right. I think. Um, I think it would, for me, it, it sort of comes down to the, the beauty of creative cloud is that you can, you know, get your feet wet on both of those apps and, and give them a go and see what naturally kind of 
you know lights you up and what makes you um excited so if you're if you're someone who like just loves shooting footage then premiere is probably going to be you know you're going to gravitate toward premiere simply because it's it's an incredible environment for editing um footage you've got literally everything you need whereas if you're a, a after effects is like a playground uh, if you've ever had a go with photoshop i always think of um it, after effects is like photoshop with time so that you can um it's got nice. a, a comes with a whole bunch of effects already it comes with uh you know with vector shapes and so on it's just an amazing amount you can do out of the box and so i suppose if you were thinking about it paradigmatically that you've got after effects is like a kind of you, you can start with nothing and, and build something and premiere you're starting with something i.e your footage and then you're building something out of that and so you i guess it sort of yeah it depends on what you really gravitate to for me i started with after effects simply because i was in an environment where other people were using it and i was just like it blew my mind the first time i saw it i was just like i did not know that you could do that that was in the 90s um <laughs> we're going back some time now and and premiere i came to much later um and premiere actually I, I don't think there's one that i would kind of prefer or recommend over the other in terms of learning first it's really just a matter of what you gravitate towards and what you find exciting great i love it i love that answer well um thank you for the question so we'll jump into part two what do you say great yeah awesome okay. cool I'm switching back over to you, um, but that doesn't mean that we can't take questions. So feel free to ask questions as we go through. Um, jump in a chat over behance.net slash live. Um, we're here for Absolutely. about another 50 minutes. Um, so yep. please don't hesitate. Ask us some questions. And if there's something we haven't covered that you do want covered, let us know because we could either point you to the one last week if it is something we covered then, um, or it could, uh, you know, change um, what we're doing next week um, so we can yeah adapt it to to what you might want to learn yeah 100 percent um the the uh the stuff with the type and the stuff with the narration were both from questions from last week um and actually what we're jumping into now is, is also uh, inspired by a question from last week as well so question away so we've we've basically coming back to our little menu here we had a look at warp stabilizer we had a look at the text tool and library titles uh, we've added some narration and now uh, we wanted to have a look at effects and masks first of all we're going to look at the crop effect and split screen so cool. this was um, um there was one, one there was yeah, there was yeah. one more comment to, um anthony was saying yeah um would you say that after effects is like photoshop and premiere pro is like lightroom <laughs> yeah um I think I feel like Premiere, if you were going to compare them to a different Adobe app, I would say Premiere might have more in common with InDesign because I feel like right. you you yep. kind of you're kind of pulling things together to create something new. I think I think Lightroom you're kind of creating yeah, I don't know, maybe this metaphor is not right, but um, Lightroom is is more kind of like you're working on individual items whereas with InDesign you're pulling together a whole yeah. bunch of items to create something longer to create a narrative yeah i see if that you like. for sure is that a good metaphor yeah 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 yeah, yeah. and then you know you're pulling yeah, in photos probably. and imagery and stuff that you might that you might edit in photoshop or elements that you might create or edit in illustrator and kind of bring it all in into one big project i can see yeah how... well you're creating a kind of a, a, a longer narrative out of components whereas with mm. lightroom you're kind of looking at individual like you'll, you'll work on one photograph and then you'll move on to another photograph and so mm. they're more discreet mm. um yeah it's a good question i don't know mm. um okay so coming coming into this one this is so I, I wanted to talk about the um this is this the split screen because this is something that i think is just a really it's a classic kind of effect it looks great and it's um it's not difficult to achieve and it lets us talk about some different effects and um, different uh, areas that we haven't touched on yet. So I've just got a couple of clips here side by side. This is, um, again, that famous Kyoto vegetation and some fans. Um, now I'm just going to 
use my using my option key or alt key on windows i'm going to drag over and i don't want that that's the audio track and i'm not interested in that here so i'm just going to drag over those so they're highlighted the reason i held down my option key is if i didn't it would choose the video as well so in this instance i'm just going to hold down the option key to temporarily turn off linked selection if I didn't want to hold down the option key for some reason. I can turn off link selection with this button in my toolbar here. And now when I drag over it, I don't need to hold anything down and it will only select the audio. I'll turn that back on and I'm just going to hit the delete key. So now I only have the video this fly bugging me. Um, and I want to put these so that they're side by side and we're going to do a split screen effect so that I can see them vertically one on the left side and one on the right side. So the first thing I'll do is I'm going to chop this in half. So there's a, there's a couple of ways of doing that. If I uh, select that clip and I go up to my effect controls here, I could literally just move it off the stage. So by hovering over the uh, motion here, I can that you can see that it says 640, which basically means it's in the center of the screen. If I hover over that, my cursor turns into a little left and right scrubber. And if I click and drag, I'm moving my clip. So I could just move it off the stage like that. So now the position is zero. I'm going to reset it. But if I was interested in this side of the clip, that's the bit that I just cropped off, then I would need to use an effect. So I'm just going to choose my, I'm going to go over here to the effects panel. And I'm going to search for crop. I'll drag that onto my clip and now it's going to appear in my effect controls panel and you can see I can choose how much it's conveniently uh, done in percentage so proportions and I'm going to say I want to crop the left side of this I can either type it in 50% or I could again use the scrubber like that to get the right amount. So because I know that it's 50%, I will just type that in there. And now I've cropped off half of my image. Mm. And I could leave it on that side of the screen. Or I could also move it over here. Again, I know that it's um, zero is going to put it right on the left. So by using it, sometimes by using the numbers um, rather than dragging things around, you're going to make sure that things are perfect and that it's all going to line up beautifully. Now, my other clip, I will, I'm going to move that up and I'm going to move it across. Now, they're occupying the same uh, space and time. So I've obscured the one that we were just looking at. If I drag that on top, now you can see that we have that split screen effect that we were going for. So when I play that back, we've got the two clips side by side. Alternatively, I could Again, using the copy and paste attributes, I'll just separate those so it's easier to see. If I copy the effect, so I'm just going to right click here, I'm going to choose copy, come over here, I'm going to right click and I'll say paste attributes. I'm going to paste the, there's a little zoom window in my way. Uh, so I'm going to paste the motion and the crop effect. Now they're both cropped in the same way, and I can just override here position. I'm going to drag that out until it hits the other side and I can see 640. And now when I put them side by side again, you can see that they are, wow. we have that lovely split screen effect. That's cool. You, yeah. You could also, um, so this one, this green one is on top here. So you could actually animate the, the crop effect if you wanted to to reveal it so that if I had, say, for example, a little play for one second. So I'm just going to move my time uh, play here to one second here. And now coming down to the crop effect like that at, uh, you know what, I'm just going to reset the position and reset the crop. And we'll do the same for this one so that we've we're basically going back to where we were, but what I'm going to do is animate the crop so that the one on top reveals the one underneath. So you can see there's the one underneath. Here's the one on top. So 
I will say one second, I'm going to drop in a keyframe for the left and then over a period of say two seconds. So we'll move it to three. Then we'll say the right. Actually, you know what? I'm going to animate the other one. It will look a bit better. So we'll animate the right side rather than the left side. So drop a keyframe in here. So I use the stopwatch to put it into keyframe mode. And now to add another keyframe, this is the keyframe button. So I could just type in keyframe or I can just press that there. And as you can see, there's no keyframe there at the moment. And when I press that button, now there is a keyframe. And I can quickly jump between the existing keyframes using these mm. next and previous. So for, at one second, there is no cropping on the right. And then if I go to three seconds, I want it to be 50% cropping on the right. And when I play it back now, we get a cool. reveal. Nice. Yeah. Now it looks a little bit sort of janky because there was no easing on those keyframes. If I select them in there and then right click, uh, I can say, uh, let's see, I'm going to say, I'm going to ease this one and say ease in and this one ease out. And now when I play it back, you'll see that there's a little bit more. Actually, it didn't really look any different to me. No, it didn't. No. <laughs> <laughs> I was yeah. just thinking the same Great thing. Demo. I didn't, didn't quite notice it. It might not work exactly how I expect. Usually I would, yeah. Oh, there it is. That's more like it. I, I had it I had it the wrong way around. It seems to be different to how I would ex expect from coming from an After Effects background. But there you go. Anyway, that's basically so you, now you've got, and this is somewhere where you don't have um, as much control in Premiere as you do in After Effects. So. And after effects, you've got uh, more control over the easing of keyframes, mm -hmm. but for to a large extent, I mean, this is um, you can you can actually you can see the curves in here. So I could actually go and I just said that you don't have as much control, but look at that, you do. <laughs> so I could get quite um, by changing the easing here. So now that's going to really slowly accelerate out, and, and then get very quickly in the middle, and then slowly ease back in in the middle. So when we play that back, go full screen so you can see what I'm talking about. Yeah. So, and again, so quite yeah, a nice effect and quite a lot. Yeah. Yeah. So you, you can get really crazy. You could even have a, like a slight overshoot amount as well. So now it's going to go further than 50% and then come back to 50%. So you can see that you can get quite creative, go all the way out there and then come back. Oh yeah. So yeah, there's a lot that you can achieve. Um, again, this is something we touched on be before, but just Premiere, there is a lot that you can achieve in Premiere without having to go mm. into After Effects. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Okay, so that was, um, this is the crop effect and split screen. The guides is something that hasn't been in Premiere forever. Oh, there, was a question, so there was a question oh, yeah, just on, on there around um, what is um, Bezier in that context? I think one of the, one of the options when you uh, right click for the easing, I think, mm. um, I think that was an option. Do we know what that does? Yeah, so you've, you've got, it's basically like whether something is, um, if something is linear, it means that there's, there's no um, easing at all. So that's, there's mm. your linear kind of curve. So that's a straight line. And when you, when you select Bezier, it puts handles Bezier. on it. So Did I say Bezier? Bezier. It's yeah, an Australian it accent thing, totally. Easier to say Bezier. It was <laughs> Um, <laughs> um, it, but yes, I, I, I'm, I'm not sure exactly how it's pronounced, but I think I've, I've heard Bezier, so I say that. Let's go with your version. Um, okay. <laughs> and so you can see the difference um, from, if I select those there, linear, there's completely no easing, no acceleration, no deceleration. The speed is constant throughout. So it starts at full speed and it ends at full speed. If I choose uh, Bezier, it'll put handles on there for me. And so there's a tiny little bit of easing. And then Auto Bezier is, is more to do with um, the way that it, if there was another keyframe over here, then 
auto bezier is going to try and smooth out this right. handle here mm. uh and similarly um continuous bezier is going to try and keep the try and keep that that curve uh, it's it's going to try and mm. It's going to try and keep the speed as constant as it can. I think that's my understanding of it. Mm. And a hold keyframe is effectively going to um, it's going to it's going to keep that value constant until it gets to the next keyframe, which is probably worth having a quick look at because it is interesting. Um, if I go back to a linear um, setting, and now if I put in a couple more keyframes in here, so I'm going to put in those two keyframes, and I'm going to choose them all. Like if I if I play that back now. It'll, it won't, there's no easing, but it sort of goes at a roughly linear kind of one to the other. Mm. If I change those to hold keyframes, you can see on the graph, now it's a step effect, mm. which means that it will abruptly change from one value to the next with no easing between them at all. So if I pr play that back, it'll suddenly come in like doink, 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 doink. Mm -hmm. And one more cool. time. So no easing whatsoever it just jumps from one value to the in. next mm. yeah yeah so that's your hold keyframe so there's usually usually if i was going to get um really uh up to my eyeballs and keyframes and bezier curves then i'd be in after effects but obviously in premiere there's a lot that you can there's a lot you can do in there so and that was just on that um that was all under I put the keyframes in here. There's a little arrow here to the left of that stopwatch. When you flip that open, that's where you're going to see all of these um, curves right. and so on, so that you can get uh, more specific about you know how you want your keyframes to behave. So that's just it's just tucked away neatly there, so that if you saw that graph every time, I don't know, it might be kind of <laughs> intimidating, but um, mm. you, it's nice to know where it is if you need it. Yeah, very good. Mm. Um, okay, so that was that was a crop effect in split screen, um, which led me into guides, which I, I think is uh, such a great addition to uh, Premiere. Uh, as I mentioned before, it hasn't had guides forever, uh, so it's it's been a really really welcome addition. So in the program monitor right now, we don't have any guides, we don't have any rulers. I'm just going to go to the view menu. Uh, just importantly, it's it, you can see the blue line around this panel that means that it has the focus if something's not working for you just make sure that it does have the focus if i have the if i give the focus to that timeline now it has the blue line around it i go to the view menu a whole bunch of these options are grayed out and that's because the program monitor needs to have the focus so i'll just click there on the gray bit hit the view menu and now i can choose show rulers and now these pop up you can drag guides out. Uh, just clear those guides really quickly. So you can drag guides out there, just like you can in Illustrator or Photoshop, InDesign. And if I right-click on one of these guides, I can type in an exact value. So you can actually have either um, a percentage. So I could say, okay, I'm interested in having that guide at exactly 25%, and it'll just jump to that point. And similarly on the left here, so 25%, or if you know how many pixels you want the guide to be at, then um, you can type that in as well. So in this instance, I'll say, okay, I want that to be 50% of the screen, and this one could be 50% of the screen as well. And this is extremely handy, especially if you're trying to, you know, I want to visually confirm that my split screen is exactly halfway um, down the middle of my stage. I can just drop a couple of guides in and that way I can make sure that it's going to be correct wherever, you know, throughout all of my sequences. Um, similarly, you can actually, this is a little bit advanced, but if you, um, you can con create guides in um, After Effects or Photoshop, you can export them and you can actually import them. So if I clear them here, I've imported a few before. So this is this, um, Safe margins is one of the built-in ones. So these are basically the margins where you, you clear space so that you can only have text within that region without it getting cut off by uh, television, for example. 
or alternatively, um, if I get rid of that, I can say guide templates center 720. So 720 in this instance is the resolution of the uh, sequence that I'm working on. I just choose that and it'll drop a couple of guides in there mm. automatically. And so huge time saver and it really helps that consistency. Yeah, that's such a great time saver. Guides are yeah. great, super useful. Guides are awesome. And <laughs> also um, you can have, so I'm just going to go into uh, bring a new bit of footage in here, say, here we go and um, double click that. I'm just going to drag it into my timeline and I can, if I want to edit where that sits on my page, if I select it there, it's not selected here. There's a one more step I need to do. Go to the effect controls panel here. I just have to click on the word motion here. Now it's come up with these handles and I can actually drag it on the stage. So when I move it around, you can see it's actually snapping to, and that's because I've got snap and program monitor. It's snapping to the edges of the page um, or the stage, if you like, and it's snapping to those guides as well. So incredibly easy way to get things lined up and get things exactly where you need them. You don't have to be mm -hmm. zoomed all the way in. You know that it's going to be pixel perfect because you're using those guides and because you've got snap to uh, snap and program monitor selected. That's super cool. With the um, with the guides on the on the side, how often do you need to think about um, like the different like um, like the bleeding, like what can what can be seen on a TV or anything? Is it only when you're working with like ads or anything, or when does that kind of come into play? Yeah, it, it used to be uh, way more kind of um, relevant, I suppose. Like so much of what I do now is is just for delivery online. Like it's, it's yeah. people want videos, uh, so it's going to be played back. Uh, it's going to go to you know a, a pre-roll ad for YouTube, or it's going to be a YouTube video, or it's going to uh, be seen on Vimeo, or um, just delivered to phones. You know, like we get a lot of Instagram stories. Instagram actually, that's a that's a uh, good exception where sometimes you get something like an Instagram story um, as a vertical format. And then you've got, uh, it needs clear space at the bottom because there's a kind of a little swipe up yeah. uh, icon mm -hmm. that you need to have. So then you can't have text in that area. So you still have to have clear space, um, but it's changed. Back in the day, we it used to be like, you know, four by three um, cathode ray tube and it would, the sort of tube would literally wrap around and you'd lose a whole bunch of content out of there. Mm. So you had your title safe where any word had to be within a certain proportion of the screen and then action safe. And so if you had something relevant happening that wasn't within the action safe uh, area, then it would just be sort of lost right. to oblivion. And so um, in some regards, it's it's easier now because, you know, you can, you, you can basically make sure that, you know, all of your pixels are going to be seen if you're uploading to YouTube and you don't have to worry about it. However, there are caveats if you're um, particularly with uh, programmatically placed ads, so Instagram or Facebook or these kinds of mm -hmm. things. And you, you have to be aware of, of the end medium, um, what restrictions there are on there. And so those guides, extremely helpful. I wouldn't be surprised if people have actually published um, templates and guides for Premiere and After Effects for precisely those purposes. Yeah, certainly. And I guess that, that's an interesting point. Like I think even on YouTube, like in the bottom, you might be able to see here, like on the bottom corner, it's got like a little subscribe to the Adobe Live channel at the moment. Like even just being aware of that sort of thing, you might think, oh great, I'm gonna put my logo in the bottom left corner. Or I'm gonna put a title in the bottom left corner, but actually in the output, something's overriding that. So it's gonna look really messy. So yeah, yeah that, that point of really having a look at your medium, having a look at your output, um, is, a, is a really good one. Good thing to keep in mind. Yeah, yeah, definitely. All right, so guides are extremely helpful, extremely welcome um, addition to Premiere. Uh, okay, so we looked at importing guides. That was effectively, if, if you, you can create guides, um, there's some amazing tools in Photoshop, for example, where you can just automatically create a grid. You just basically type in uh, how many columns you want, the gutters, and it'll generate your guides for you. You can export that as a guides file, which is um, 
it's it's literally just text. It's a uh, JavaScript um, notation, and then import those straight into Premiere. And so you don't have to be you know kind of dragging things and, and calculating them. And um, within Premiere, you can just use the right tool for the job, and you just bring it straight in. And you can even have different colored guides, which I think is just so. What a nice feature! You can't do that in <laughs> Illustrator. I mean, how? Who knew that Premiere's guides would become more customizable than Illustrator? Not me. <laughs> um, okay, so that's. Uh, oh yeah, so we we had a look at that positioning clips. So limiting an effect with a mask. This is really cool. This is. Um, I, I think this is something that uh, if you haven't seen this before, if you don't know about it, it's it's a lot of fun. Um, and I am going to choose, let's see, maybe I'm just going to make a brand, or just use use this one. So I'm just going to take one clip here um, in my file. Sure, I'll, make, I'll choose a brand new clip. Here's my other kid, and we're going to apply a clip. And we're going to apply so a bit of an effect to her. Oh, thank you. This is a few years ago. Um, so. All right, well, I'm just going to chop into this clip a little bit here and keyboard shortcuts. Should we just let people know how you quickly open keyboard shortcuts there? I know we covered it last week, but it's such a useful thing for Premiere. Oh, yeah. So um, in uh, the, the default keyboard shortcut to get into the keyboard shortcuts, which is kind of meta, is command option K, which uh, would be control alt K on Windows. So you know, just tap that and then you can make yourself your, your brand new. I've got one uh, originally called Ian. You can call yours Ian as well if you like. Mine's called um, Ian you too, make yeah. Yourself... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's quite a coincidence. Um, and then you, you, you've you just, it is just such a nice way to, compared to how it used to be, this is just such a nice way to do it. So you can see immediately, I don't have anything assigned to the F4 key up there. So if I wanted to um, get your commands down here, I can choose whatever shortcut that I want. So see clip, rename, just drag F4 onto that. And now that's assigned. Mm. Um, so it's just an incredibly easy way to, to, you know, go through your keyboard shortcuts, see which ones are free and, you know, there's, an enormous amount of customization you can do. And there's the fact that you can create your own custom set. Um, and also we, we had a look at this last week, but it's worth bearing in mind. If you hit copy to clipboard and I'm just going to launch up a, a text editor and press paste. Here's every single command and it's, um, it's relevant keyboard shortcut that, um, it, that has been associated with it so that you can just if there's a command in there you can just search this file see you know what's what's in there see if there's anything that's helpful i always like looking for things called toggle uh i think toggle things are you know really helpful for some reason toggle maybe it's just the word toggle like this maybe one toggle like full toggle. screen mm -hmm. i like toggle toggle full screen here's one that you can just basically if you didn't know about that if i hold down and you can see it here it's control back tick if I type control back tick, it'll just take me straight mm. into that full screen. So that's a great way to mode, learn, so. great way to learn the shortcuts as well. Cause we spoke about that a lot, like fi finding efficiency in these programs allows you yeah. to spend more time on the creative side of things rather than clicking around menus and trying to find things. Yeah, it's, it's honestly, I know maybe not everyone is obsessed with keyboard shortcuts as me, but I, the amount of time that, it, that you can save um, when you discover, a, if you've been doing something laboriously, like hunting through menus and so on, there might be a keyboard shortcut there for you. And um, when you find it, it's like, honestly, it's like a birthday present. It's just so nice. Um, so yeah, here's another keyboard shortcut. So this one, I just realized, I was wondering why it wasn't trimming. And this is actually something that I, I'm just gonna go down this little side, uh, Slight, slight little rabbit hole here for just two seconds. So what I wanted to do with this clip here is I just wanted to trim it, trim out all of this stuff so that it started at this point, which we can see on the screen here. And normally I would just press the Q key and that would trim all of this stuff. I was pressing the Q key and it wasn't working. And the reason it wasn't working is because these are your auto select 
um, buttons here. So when these are when these are lit up, you don't even have to have anything selected when you make certain edits. So if I turn on V3 and now I press the Q key, it trimmed. It did what I wanted it to. If I undo and I turn that off and I press the Q key, nothing happens. So that is what these ones are. So you've got down here on the left, this is your um, like destination. So that if I edit something, if I um, bring in this clip, for example, if I now edit that into my timeline by pressing the uh, full stop, it's that was the destination. So it went from here mm. into V1 and the audio went into A1. So similarly, oh. if I, if I, but with the Q shortcut for trimming that one, I needed to have that turned on. I can turn them all on and off very quickly by pressing, by holding down the shift key and clicking one of them and they'll all turn on and off at the same time. So just a little side note. Nice. Okay. So if I choose a, a um, I'm going to choose a, there was a nice effect here called dot pixels. So I'm just going to drag dot pixels onto that clip. This is, um, oh, look at that. I haven't typed in the serial number for it. I'm going to use a different effect. So get rid of that red cross. Okay. This one is called data glitch. And when I turn up the glitch count, you can see it sort of turns into this like super cool. Oh, well, that's, crazy. that's not, that's not the streaming. That's actually the effect. <laughs> Thanks. Give me a heart attack over so, here. So yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> So that's, um, that's deliberately putting these kind of glitchy type um, effects onto the image, which I think makes it look kind of cool and Blade Runner-ish. Um, and you can, you can play around with the settings here and make it as uh, kind of glitchy as you like. So say something about here. Now say that I wanted to have that effect, but I didn't want it to apply to the whole image. And you can see here under the data glitch effect, you've got these different controls. So these are different masks. So it's create an elliptical mask, rectangular mask, or draw your own mask. In this instance, I am going to create a four point polygon mask. When I click that, you can see it's associated that mask with this effect. So now when I go in here, I can drag over those two points. I'm going to drag them out here and I'm going to hold down the shift key so that they stay on that horizontal axis. I'm going to do the same up here. Oops. And one more time. Oops. Yeah, it really is a live demonstration folks. And then similarly, as you can see, you can rotate it as well. And now that glitchy effect, which I'll just turn up a little bit so that you can really see it's only applying to where that mask is. Cool. Yeah. So you can, you can mask out part of the image. And when I play that back, it's well, maybe I could move that mask over to the other side. Actually it might look a little bit, might make more sense. I'm using my guide uh, in the middle there to make sure it's half of the screen. And now when I press play, you can see it's got that cool glitchy effect only on half of the image. So that nice. way you can you can limit an effect to um, part of your part of your clip. You can choose exactly what it is. You can even feather it as well. If I wanted it to sort of fade out over time, so turn up that feather amount. You can see it now. It's kind of got that fading in mm. type vibe. Oh yeah, that's super cool. Yeah. Now there's a really cute puppy that I wanted to show you. We saw this last week, and it's um so adorable i'm going to bring it back i'm not sure we saw this clip in particular but what you can do with one. masks yeah is this the one mm -hmm. don't forget a little puppy face like that <laughs> so in this instance what i want to do is you can sort of see it's a really nice clip but the puppy's face is a bit too dark for what we want so if i'm going to zoom in here you can sort of see super cute mm. but we want to see the puppy's face a little bit better so we're going to use mask tracking to bring that out a little bit. Now what I want to do is I'm going to choose my Lumetri color effect. 
I'll just type it in here to this is the I'm on the effects workspace which means my effects panel is visible over here I've just typed in Lumetri color in the search field and it's shown me under color correction there's Lumetri color so that's just bas your basic kind of like um, built-in color correction effect so if I drag that from the effects panel onto the clip in the timeline it's going to pop up over here alternatively I'm going to hit undo under the color workspace if I choose that one you will get over here it's still on essential graphics but next to that if I click Lumetri color you've got all these controllers here which is actually a really nice way to to use it and edit mm -hmm. so right we now we talking about Lightroom before and this is a lot of the things that will be going to look very very familiar for those that are familiar with Lightroom yeah super everything in here is super familiar to anyone who's used Lightroom or uh, if you've imp ever imported a raw image or a, a digital negative into Photoshop mm. all of these controls very familiar to you like exposure temperature you know contrast and so on so um, this is a non-destructive way to change your image um, to change your your clip uh, you can have multiple lumetri color effects as well uh, if you want to get focused on um, which I, I might just I'll show you the mask tracking and then I'll show you how you can do multiple lumetri color effects which is really handy and useful so we like this uh, cute puppy here but we we think that the face should be a little bit brighter so what I'm going to do is right now you can see I've got this effect um, I've got this clip rather selected and under effect controls there's no lumetri color effect but once I start editing here immediately it will drop a lumetri color effect it will automatically apply the effect to my clip once I start um, moving anything around any sliders or anything over here so I'm just going to brighten that up a bit so I'm taking up the exposure one and a half stops and now I'm going to limit the lumetri color effect by clicking an ellipse mask it's dropped it in here and you can see that now only the, inside the um, ellipse is, has got that 1.5 stops of exposure applied if I press play now it's like a sort of spotlight it's not it's, it's basically in the same place and the camera is waving around all over the place and so we lose the puppy's face however these buttons under the mask uh, property there's a mask tracking so by pressing play and what I'll go do I'm just gonna make sure preview is turned on so you can see it it's it's it'll be slightly faster with preview off but for the purposes of the demonstration we'll leave it on and when I press play it's going to go through frame by frame and it's going to try to keep the mask attached to whatever element you had selected with the mask if you like so in this instance we've got the puppy's face which is a nice easy one to track onto it's called um, it's, it's a planar tracker which means that it will, it will actually try and um, track a large area of pixels rather than just one pixel right. which makes it nice and easy to use and now with the these controls here I, I like the track I think it's done a good job of that um, but you can sort of see that it's it's attached itself to the puppy's face but it doesn't look natural it looks, it looks like, like there's a, a kind little, of a little uh, he's got a little helmet like a little cool little space dog <laughs> yeah well, yeah well you could actually just tell the client there's your space dog job done and collect your paycheck or exactly. You could you could also um, if I come in here and now with looking at the lumetri going back to the lumetri color under mask here I can expand that mask out so right now there are no controls visible on my um, on my clip in there but all I have to do to get them back is just tap on that mask uh, button over here all my controls come back and you can see I'm just going to go into um, uh, bring up that panel a little bit more. Uh, and just there's a distinction here so before we um, by digging around in that text file we found that there was a um, control backtick comes into full screen mode but it's like full screen preview mode so it's hidden the controls so if you want to get all keep all of your controls so that you can still see what you're working on I'm just gonna hover over that uh, panel there and I'm just gonna press a backtick by itself and now I can see all of my controls are in there I'm going to choose fit 
from this little pop-up menu here and now I can keep editing on it. So there's a there's a distinction there. Control back tick, preview, and just regular back tick is like expand that panel. Awesome. So if I expand that, you can see here, there's my ellipse. Um, this, there's a square and then there's a, a round dot. The square lets you just expand the mask. So it's just literally making the area that's affected larger. And then the little dot is that's softness. So if I drag that out, you can see I'm making the, um, the area around that mask much softer. So now when I play it back, you can see that the, the puppy's face is mm. lighter, but we can't see the mask anymore. It's much more, it's much more subtle. Yeah. And just to emphasize that fact, you, we can sort of, again, I'm going to, I'm going to copy that clip and I'm going to paste it at the end here. I'm going to right click on it and choose remove attributes. So we'll get rid of the lumetri color that we were just working on. It's going to go back to normal. And then when I play them back to back, we can see this is the one without the mask that's been tracked on. And this is the one that has the mask yeah. that's been tracked on. See, space so it, yeah, a much easier way to, um, a, a really easy way to just get that sort of level of detail where we want it by using mask tracking. Uh, it doesn't take too long mm. and you get a cute puppy. Get a free so, puppy out of that. Um, you get to keep the puppy, actually, which is one of the, something we should have mentioned, uh, one of the finer features of, of Premiere Pro. Um, yeah, Victoria, <laughs> it's, a, it, it's funny. That's that's um, one of the things that has kind of come up a couple of times uh, in the in the last stream as well, which is just what you can do in Premiere Pro uh, that, you know, you might always think that After Effects, you know, is, is the only way to do that. But, yeah, like tracking, mask tracking is possible within Premiere Pro. And that's how you do it. it yeah, it is. It's it's incredibly um, powerful and really, um, as you can see there, it's, it's not difficult. You, you just make a mask around the feature that you want and you just press that little, uh, this little play button down here and it will track frame by frame. Now, mm. I've deliberately chosen an example that's going to be easy. If you, if the element that you're tracking goes behind an object, for example, if there was um, somebody had walked in front of the camera that's a problem, then you might have to break it into two separate parts um, because the, the track is going to lose the puppy's face. It's not going to be able to find it anymore. And so then you might need to break it into separate parts. But for a simple fix, something like this, then yeah, it's extremely easy and um, really efficient way of doing things. Um, so I mentioned before about having multiple lumetri color effects on one clip. I will let so you know that we have about five yep. minutes left, believe it or not, it goes very fast. Yeah, it really does. Um, that's cool because that means I've got a whole bunch of all this other stuff for next time. Awesome. And and then some. So mm. we're, we're basically, um, I think, yeah, we can sort of probably, well, we'll see how we go. But um, the multiple lumetri color, multiple effects. So this is, yeah, that's one effect there. So in order to keep track of them. So sometimes it's, it's really helpful to... Um, rather than trying to do all of your adjustments with one effect you can just make a new instance of that effect or apply a fresh instance of that effect and separate them out so this instance we can call that um we'll give that uh puppy face puppy face and you can see let's put that in brackets under there so that's our first lumetri color effect now if i come in here I can I can go in here uh, to my lumetri color palette. It's got puppy faces there. I can add lumetri color effect, and it's automatically put a new one there. And now I'm editing the new one. So then I could adjust, for example, the overall exposure. I could um, bump up the contrast uh, of the whole effect, uh, pump up the highlights a little bit, and so that's mm. distinct. And so we could we could give that a name like overall. And the order, the order of these will make a, a little bit of a difference as well. So I'm going to do the overall, they're, they're applied from the top down. So right. if you, if it's like overall is here, that's going to be done first. And I think that looks a little bit more natural than doing puppy face and then overall. Mm. So we're going to make our overall effects to the entire image and then puppy face afterwards. And as you can see, 
and puppy face just as a reminder is that mask track one so i can toggle those individually and you can see the difference it's actually now when you turn off puppy face it actually looks unnatural even though that was how it was shot mm. um and so by having multiple effects and naming them so that you can keep track of um each one is a, is a really efficient way of of working and it just makes it clear to you by renaming them what your intentions were at the time so when you come back to something i can see oh yeah puppy face that's i understand what i was doing there mm. um and just on that while i think of it as well just one more little tweak here this you could um, also, I'm going to choose overall for up here. The white balance selector is just that little eyedropper. I'm just going to drag that and I'm going to click on something that's supposed to be white in my scene. This scene looks a little bit warm to me. When I click on that, it cools it down mm. and that ought to just be a little it. bit more. Yeah, so I'll just do that one more time. Uh, so I can reset. I'm just going to undo. Well, the other way that if, you, if I was... Um, if these if these settings were sort of all over the place i can also just double click on the name and it'll oh, sorry double click on the slider and it will reset it to zero uh, and that's the escape, that works with any the escape of those. key of the of the sliders i see yeah, yeah exactly it's uh, handy to be able to get back to where you started and i know that from bitter experience mm. um so when i all i have to do is click that eyedropper uh once and it, sorry no it's a slightly I'm thinking of uh, a different program. So if I, it's actually more of a click and drag thing. So I click on there, drag it over. And then when I get to the color, oh God. And, we, and then when I get to the color I want, I just let go. And then it's applied the mm. uh, temperature settings. So that's um, without going into like too much detail, the white balance is um, the color of the, the light. So depending on what environment you're in, um, if you're outside, the light is uh, actually quite cool. Sunlight is quite cool. Whereas mm -hmm. if you're indoors and that sort of in an incandescent light, that light is much warmer. And if your camera um, hasn't automatically adjusted correctly for the white balance, then you might need to override it or correct it in post, which mm -hmm. is what we've done here. So by using that little eyedropper and just choosing something in the scene that is white, that we know is white, like this window uh, ledge, then it's automatically adjusted the temperature and the tint to make that white and everything else in the scene automatically gets adjusted as well. So if we have a look at um, what the scene looked like before any effects were applied, um, and I think we touched on this before, but I added this little button uh, to the program monitor, which is that global mm. effects mute. I just dragged it down here. And when I tap that, it'll just turn off all of the effects at once and you can, you can see, see just how done. much kind of yeah that's awesome it's, it's much more kind of brighter and um, more appealing um we're we're getting the, we're getting the music we're getting the leave the stage music because we've got about 30 seconds left before before behance will uh will move on to the to the next stream so um thank you so much ian it's been awesome we've covered a lot of ground uh but it yes. definitely goes fast so we've got more to do next week so um thank you everyone in chat for joining us we'll be here at the same time next week um, with Ian Haig, and we're going to continue on um, learning Premiere Pro. If you jumped in halfway, you can go back to the previous version. It's all up on YouTube, so you can check that out. Um, I will be back tomorrow at the same time with Jeremy Lord, uh, and we're doing beginners into illustration, same sort of model, but in a completely different medium. Um, thank you, Ian. Thank you so much for joining us today. My pleasure. Thanks for tuning in. And we'll see you next week, and we'll see everybody in chat next week. Thanks so much. See you later. See ya.